record to cloud. All right. Okay. Welcome everyone to the Twin Cities Large Scale Scrum Meetup. Uh, today we have Joanna Rothman. Uh, she is going to be giving a presentation on modern management made easy books that she authored and uh, how that uh, connects with large scale scrum. Uh, they fit together very nicely. It should be a very interesting presentation. Um, I'll, I'll actually let uh, Vlad introduce because this is Vlad's guest. Vlad is uh, one of my longtime mentors and colleagues and uh, previous managers. Uh, Vlad, uh, would you like to uh, kick it off uh, or introduce Johanna in your own way? Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Johanna Rothman. Uh, Johanna Rothman, known as the pragmatic managers, a manager, and uh, she offers a frank advice for your tough problems. She helps leaders and teams to do reasonable things that work. Equipped with that knowledge, uh, they can decide how to adapt their product development. She's an author of 18 books and hundreds of articles. Uh, find the Pragmatic Manager, a monthly email newsletter, and her blogs at jrothman.com and uh, create adaptablelive.com and I put that in the chat as well so you can uh, have both links and uh, I personally uh, read a number of books and find it a great value uh, also I'm a follower uh, and of a blog and a newsletter and appreciate those excellent and uh, thought-provoking posts uh, they help me reevaluate uh, things I do and they help to have a fresh perspective to the product surfacing new options for improvement. And with a great pleasure, I'd like uh, to ask Joanna to start a presentation. Uh, please, Joanna. Okay, David, I think you're going to have to stop sharing there. I will let me share my screen. As of course, I have slides. There, I believe you can see my my slides now. I'm, I have popped all of your happy faces out over onto my other monitor. Let me get the chat also. Okay, I am ready. And put your questions so, into chat. And uh, she's, uh, Johanna said yes. she's willing to, to take your questions as the presentation goes. So please make it interactive. Thanks. Yes. Um, you might have to type fast so, so that I see your question. I have I have the chat open closer to this monitor. So I want you to think back to your best managers. What do you remember? Just put it in the chat. What do you remember of your best managers? And I'm not asking you to define best. I'm just saying, think back to your best managers. Tell me what you remember, put it in the chat. And if you want to be anonymous, um, I guess maybe do a direct message to me and I will I will say somebody said this. So your best managers, what do you remember? Supportive, protective. That's nice, Sharon. Yep. Unifying, supportive. Thank you, Vlad. Listen to me. That's a great one, Walt. Yeah. A lot of space to fail and to learn. That's a huge, huge thing. Feedback, that's good. Supportive and encouraging. Empowering, great. And let me ask you this. Oh, clear mission intent, empowering me to act without micromanagement and considerate. So what do you remember of uh, whether, whether it's the team, the product, or, or just your feelings. I'm, I'm putting just in quotes. Do you remember the product or the team? Anybody else? Because you're, you're really talking about how you felt, which is, I mean, yeah, really cool. Feelings more than anything else. That's my experience also. Now, think back to your worst managers. And again, I'm not going to ask you to name names. I'm not going to ask you how you define worst. What do you remember of the worst managers? Let's see, you put that in the chat.
focus on outputs over outcomes. Thank you, Ogden. Insincere. Oh my goodness, Sharon, that's a very big deal. Avoid critical conversations, seem to leave out details to cause failure. Feckless. That's a great word, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, um, true. Worse, clueless, not aware of team issues. Yeah. Yeah. Other things that you remember? Personal agenda over shared vision. Oh, my goodness. Politics and managing appearances. This is all stuff that I, I share your, your joy from the best managers and your pain from the worst managers. And what I find really interesting is that you are all saying how you felt. Then that's what happens. People remember how they felt with leadership with management. And when I, when I often think about the feeling business and I am, um, I am still a work in progress for being able to name my feelings, I am, a, I am very geeky. I freely admit that. So I might not, I will remember how I felt. I might not be able to put a name to it. But the power of leadership, both good and bad, people actually remember how they felt. So when I think about the excellent leadership, I think about how you can serve the team, not just individuals. Because if you, uh, I heard a bunch of things um, here, focusing on outputs over outcomes for the worst managers, um, allowing space to fail and to learn for the best managers. And um, Ogden, Oh yeah, Ogden, that's a great quote. Um, Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Okay, I guess I gotta give Maya Angelou credit for that because yeah, I thought I, I thought I came up with it. Yeah, not so much. So when we think about the team, we create space for the team to work together, space for the team to to manage themselves and create outcomes that really work for the organization. Now, one reason I'm so focused on the team, and I'm gonna talk a lot about flow efficiency in this presentation, is that flow efficiency is really about how agile teams should work, right? That should word again. So um, when we work as a team, we have the fastest way to create outcomes. So um, in, this, in this picture of flow efficiency, we said the work assignment comes in, the team works together, right? Maybe as a sub team of three or four, maybe as a larger team of five or six, maybe an even larger team of more people, but I have plenty to say about more people on the team. And um, as a team, we finish the work and then we, that's our outcome with any luck. You don't see any delays in there. When we work in resource efficiency, the first person takes the item. They, they do their work, they hand it off to the next person. They do their work, they hand it off to the next person. They do their work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You finally get the finished work. If any of you are still doing code review and you're not, somehow code reviewing as a team, as the work finishes, right? As a developer finishes the code and then go directly to code review, you have delays. You might have, you might need design reviews also for, for any number of products. I can imagine that. I would prefer to use TDD so I don't have to have a design review, but you might have a product that really demands it. So. The more you have separate steps for all these, all these, um, all the steps in your workflow, and the more you hand off work, the less you're working in flow efficiency. That means that the time that the team takes for the learning extends, 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 and you your agility becomes much, much more difficult. Now, Scrum does not actually say anything about flow efficiency or resource efficiency. There's no reason for people to take their items. There's every reason for
for a team to take their items together and say, we will only have a work in progress of one or two items at a time for this entire team. And maybe more if you have a much larger team. So, but our organizations are not set up for flow efficiency because we still have performance evaluations. We still are supposed to manage compensation and we still do all of that via resource efficiency on an individual basis. So while, while we remember how we felt with the great managers and we want to have flow efficiency in our agile teams, sometimes it's really hard to get to that point. So keep this in mind as I speak tonight. So the whole, the whole presentation here is about how we might switch the focus from an individual to a team. And for me, the really fast answer is you create an environment where everybody can lead. So a manager creates an environment where everybody can succeed. And part of success is that we are all leaders, not necessarily saying, here's the vision, I'm gonna go here, follow me. <coughs> but here's, um, here's how I can make an environment where everybody feels valued, trusted, empowered, useful. And the way we do that the, the best is with flow efficiency thinking. So um, Kim, before we started, talked about Lewin's equation. And if you're not uh, familiar, familiar with Lewin's equation, it's that a person's behavior is a function of that person and their environment. I think of environment as the physical and remote environment that we have now, and especially the culture. So a lot of you have been working, I suspect nobody's um, back at work yet, or at least not with everybody on their team. But how does a team work? Does a team work in resource efficiency or in flow efficiency? Um, does the team have psychological safety for any of their mistakes? I am really good at making mistakes. I suspect some of you are also. Um, does the team, is the team, or is every team member safe to say, I'm being really challenged by this work. I would like to work with somebody else. I need help, right? I, if you cannot admit that you need help or that you made a mistake, it's really hard to have trust among with the rest of the team. You just don't have psychological safety. And people will use their virtual and physical locations in various ways. Does the team have the ability to do that? I often find that teams where members trust each other are much more likely to work in flow efficiency because they don't have to do their work and then cover their tush before they hand off the work to somebody else. And Organizational policies and procedures might help or they might hurt how the team works. So if you've ever seen a performance problem where somebody just did not seem to fit in with the team or with the organization, it's often a function of the environment. I, I um, manage people for at least 20 years inside the organization as a project manager or program manager manager and a director and well and also a VP for not very much time. And what I discovered was almost well, I did not have to fire almost anybody because they could not do the job, the technical part of the job. But all those people who wore t-shirts that says don't that said do not does not play well with others, those people I often had to have many conversations with and I had to fire some of them. because And they, they thought that the environment was based on resource efficiency. They did not believe in, in trust and psychological safety for their team members. And I could not allow them to continue in the organization. So when I think about the environment, for me, it's all about the culture. So I really like Edgar Schein's 
ideas about culture. He talks about assumptions, artifacts, values. And I think that there's a fourth thing, but I, I have boiled it down to what people can discuss, how people treat each other, and what the organization rewards. Because those are part of the values and assumptions. And then the real question is, can you create a cross-functional team like this six-person team in the upper right corner that allows, that really works in agile ways? Maybe you have sub-teams. I often see a couple of developers and a tester work together, maybe a couple of other developers and a tester work together. So the people um, are, they collab, they cooperate across the sub-teams but they collaborate inside their team. Now, let me talk a little bit about the difference between cooperation and collaboration. A lot of people use those words interchangeably. And to me, they are not at all interchangeable. So cooperation says, um, Vlad asked me for a question. I say, sure, here's the answer, right? We're cooperating. But if we need to collaborate, Vlad asked me a question and I say, would you like me to work with you on that? He gets to say no, right, if that does not fit. But he might say, yeah, I would really like to see how you do this. So now we are collaborating on the same outcome. We're not creating outputs that we hand off from one to another. Now, sometimes outputs are exactly what you want, but more often we need outcomes because that's something valuable that people can, do, can at least ask the customer about. Now, one of the things with culture is you see all these, these six people alone at the bottom. Those six people alone, um, they're not really part of a team, right? They don't affiliate with each other. So if we think about the culture, um, does a culture reward individual work alone? Or does a culture at least partially reward team-based work? This is a huge, huge challenge that affects all of us in, in Agile teams. So I'm gonna talk about these four things and I'm gonna first start with the value the team provides. So I really like to ask the question, uh, especially when I walk into a new consulting engagement and ask what value does this team offer the organization? And sometimes, People think that this is a trick question. It's not a trick question. I, I start with a product or service. I say, well, which product or service are you working on? Product A, B, or C. Okay, fine. Hopefully not all three at the same time. Um, and then who are the customers of product A? We understand who those people are. And now what problems does this team solve for those customers? Right? It's a problem focused orientation, which allows me to discuss the team's value with the people on the team. And often when I do this, um, people say, oh, I didn't realize we did all this really good stuff. Yes, you do. So one team, I was working on their, um, their, their product vision for a new project that they were starting on. And um, they were going, this was a bank. Right. Many, I don't know how many of you work for insurance companies or banks, but um, sometimes, sometimes you do in the Midwest. So um, the, the bank was saying, well, we're going to have, it was something like, we'll have 50% more um, uh, users. And it was some number of that and some other kind of nonsense. And they said, um, this, this was a particular um, a uh, regulated industry requirement that they had to transition all the old accounts from one form to a new form. And because these were retirement accounts, then people really needed to do it by the deadline. And they were really having trouble moving people over and they could not move people over until the people agreed to change the account. So I asked, so tell me, you know, who is this for? The elderly, the retired, the, the pensioners, right? This was in the UK. Okay, um, what value would they get out of it? So one of the guys said, they're gonna get to keep all the money that they saved. 
So I said, you're saving all these old people's retirement accounts? And they all said, yeah, yeah, we are, we are. That's how you can define the team's value. And um, I really like that snarky comment, James, that sometimes the team see, sometimes seem to offer the value for the manager to feel important. Yeah, that's a culture problem. So um, it's not bad, as Vlad points out, that if they work for the manager's success, but the team offers significant value. And when, when that team offered the value of that overarching goal, right, where they said, we offer this value to our, our retired accounts people so that they get to keep all the money that they saved over their lifetime, that's, that's an outline and that's an outcome. That way you can align with outcome. And that makes all the difference in the world. So when you, when you think about this overarching goal and how can you separate out who does which goal when, right? If, if Vlad and, um, and David and I are all on one team, how do you separate out what, we, what each of us does? You might be able to separate out a little bit, but a really great team supports each other. They talk about everything. They learn together. And I suspect that all of you, whether or not you're still actually in the code or the test, or you have moved on to project or program management or, or other people-based management, you remember what it was like to bounce ideas off of each other. So I don't see how you can have only individual goals and only, only individual compensation. So when we define the team's value, now we actually have the ability to move from individual goals to partly team-based goals and, and team-based compensation. So I really like impact mapping to define the overarching team goal. Because I have found that uh, too many managers, actually the managers each have their own goals. So there's no overarching goal for a variety of managers. That's a different problem. So I really like to think about the outcomes and I find that impact mapping with its focus on what customers can achieve really helps with that particular idea. Um, I don't really like OKRs anymore because in my experience, um, they look a lot like MBOs, Management by Objectives, where somebody has this objective and instead of key results that required teams to deliver it, and they cascade all these um, objectives down to the individual. That's not an OKR. An OKR is supposed to be in this overarching goal. So really think about how you can avoid individual goals that cascade down, because that's not really helping anybody at all. So, and good code does not pay me to, um, to tell people about impact mapping. But it's a really, really good, it's a good book, it's a good website, it's, it's great. Now, when we have an overarching goal, we can learn together in flow efficiency. And especially the teams doing the work can really focus on technical excellence. Because I suspect that you have found the same thing that I have found, that the more you keep the work clean, and I'm not showing you my office, because my work environment is not clean at all. Uh, but the more we keep our, our work clean, the faster we go. So when I write, I actually keep my documents clean. And when I, when I was coding and testing, I kept my code and my test clean. When I was a project manager, um, my, my project manager my management was as clean as I could make it. I did not have kind of dangling to-dos that would prevent the other people from, from learning what they needed to do and, and delivering the outcomes that they needed to deliver. So the more we have technical excellence, the easier it is to coalesce around a goal that, um, that really creates value for the organization. And hopefully where you are, um, where you're going in this, in the, uh, for the team. So my question for all of you is,
How can the team create small experiments and learn from them? Um, I'm kind of watching you, James. You, James. I, I am. Um, I'm not going to comment on those comment. Uh, um, there are comments yet. Thank you. Okay. So the next one. Um, yes, James is a troublemaker. Thank you. So the next one is team-based leadership. A lot of for years and years and years, we thought that only the managers were the ones to offer feedback and coaching to members of the team. I actually thought that earlier in my career, and then I got really busy as a manager, and I could not actually do it all by myself. So I, I said to the people I led and served, um, I need you to offer feedback and coaching to each other. Here's how, here's, we're going to do the 15 minute feedback lab, and then we're going to do the, the 10 minute coaching lab. And of course, I was totally, I had totally under, underestimated how long it would take. So I introduced the ideas in the 15 minutes and 10 minutes. And then I had people practice. And then we reported back in our, in our team meetings um, once a week to, to talk about what we learned and what we did not learn. Feedback and coaching was just one thing that we learned as a team. And then I could offer meta, um, meta feedback and meta coaching, right? Feedback about the feedback, coaching about the coaching, feedback about the coaching, coaching about the, yeah, all that, the whole meta business. When people are able to offer each other feedback and coaching as peers, they create much more psychological safety. They create it as a team. So what I did was I offered labs during work hours, right? Here's how you offer feedback and coaching. Here's how you, um, you troubleshoot your feedback and coaching. Here's if somebody doesn't want the feedback and coaching and you think that they need it, here's what you do. So um, I have a tendency to inflict help on people. I have to really work at it because to not inflict help because I am much more likely, right? So this is, this is one of the things I have learned about my coaching that I need to not inflict help on people when they are um, learning how to coach and learning to offer coaching to other people. It does not have to be perfect for it to be useful. That's my mantra now. Not, we are not looking for perfection. We are looking for something useful, right? A real agile approach to feedback and coaching so that we get, we get, um, we get the, the gist of everything and then we move on from there. So Vlad asks, did I make these labs mandatory? Yes, I did. Because otherwise we don't offer peer-to-peer um, -peer feedback. A lot of us have experienced um, parent, parental kinds of feedback, right? Where, or sports coaching feedback or sports coaching coaching, which is not the same as peer-to-peer -peer feedback about observable behavior in the organization. So one thing that you might observe about me, I often say, I never got the fashion gene. My mother had the fashion gene. My father had the fashion gene. My husband has the fashion gene. My daughters have the fashion gene. Their spouses have the fashion gene. Totally miss me. I don't get it. I have um, typical shirts, typical sweaters, and I wear them all the time. That's what I wear for work. And so far, nobody has said that this is a problem for my work. Because while I might not have the fashion gene, my fashion gene is observable, but not observable behavior. So what, what's really important is to offer feedback and coaching about behaviors. So I really like this. Um, this is from Behind Closed Doors, Secret, Secrets and Great Management, where we create an opening, um, describe the behavior of the results, state the impact, and maybe make a request. So let me give you an example of reinforcing feedback, which is the feedback I really want people to offer more often rather than less often. So I might even say in a meeting, um, 
Vlad, I'm going to use you because you're my buddy right now. Thank you. So Vlad, I really like when you when you talked about this um, this particular kind of marketing in our call earlier today, because it gave me an opportunity to ask you some questions and then um, um, debrief with other people. So thank you for discussing that. Right. So um, that was making the request and keep asking these questions. Keep keep challenging me on this, right? So that's reinforcing feedback. I don't need to create an opening with reinforcing feedback more often, because especially if it's about something small, um, people don't need to worry about being embarrassed, I hope. I hope I did not embarrass you. And uh, when I described your behavior, I said, thank you for this thing that you did. Um, and it gave me an opportunity that was stating the impact on me and then making the request, keep asking, keep challenging. That's reinforcing feedback. We need to do something like nine times more reinforcing feedback than to every one kind of change focused feedback. The more reinforcing feedback we get, the more likely we are to change. So I have, I have said in many times, many times, I, I've been told I am too blunt and direct by my managers, by other people. When somebody gave me reinforcing feedback and they said, Johanna, when you, when you framed this particular um, issue this way, other people could hear what you said. Oh, right. And if you can do that more often, people will hear what you say better and more frequently. So I finally got the feedback I needed to stop being so blunt and direct. If you have to say, excuse me, stop doing something, people don't know what they should do instead. So that was one of the issues I always brought up in feedback and coaching, because if people don't know what, what their alternatives are, they really can't do it. I really liked uh, coaching as offering options with support. When, when, at, when a whole lot of teams started with agility, a lot of coaches thought it was their job to teach. And I find that a lot of coaches still get stuck in the teaching, right? There are nine possible coaching stances. And if you think about offering options with support and, and supporting people to generate their own options, that might be something really helpful in your coaching. I find it really helpful if I create an environment where everybody can coach everybody else. And then, of course, not inflicting help on others. So I'm glad we did all of this in, in the labs. Now, a lot of people think, and so this is an, adapt, an adaptation of Hackman's uh, table and leading teams. And we, we talk a lot about self-organizing teams and self-managing teams and self-governing teams. I don't see very many teams um, that are self-governing at all inside organizations. I see a whole lot of manager-led teams. Um, so for example, if your manager wants you to use the same uh, board as everybody else and the same um, columns as everybody else, as then your manager is trying to manage your team process. And that means you cannot even be a self-directed team. So I really like thinking about um, agile teams as self-directed teams, not so much um, self-managing, self-designing, or self-governing. So um, the managers often set the direction for the team. Managers often design the team and it's context, um, which I don't really have a problem with. I want the manager to, to stay out of, of the work process and progress. And I want the team to manage its own team process. And the team, of course, has to execute on the team tasks. And there, there are times, especially with hiring and firing, where because it's a financial decision for the company that the manager might have to be involved in that. But hopefully 
the team can do everything else. Um, and so that's, so James actually says, um, finally learning to be more effective at reading body language, even though mechanical, did wonders in helping me to better understand how people were, re were responding to me. So yes, if you see somebody kind of lean back and look like this with narrowed eyes, they might be suspicious, they might be concentrating, but they might be more suspicious than anything else. Um, luckily, I was better at reading, I was more aware of, of people's reactions to me, even though I don't always stop the mouth. So I am a big time extrovert. What's in the brain is out of the mouth before I even think about it. I, I, well, there's no thinking. Those of you who are introverts don't actually understand what I'm saying. You cannot imagine a time where you do not think first. However, extroverts like me, we don't, we don't think. We, we, we learn what we think as we say it. So, um, so that's what's really interesting. So um, Jonathan asks, the language of Scrum is self-organizing teams. Um, so I really like this. That might be the self-managing team. And my experience is that I have yet to see a self-managing team in the wild. I just don't. I see a lot of self-directed teams. Now, I am a consultant. People don't call me when things are going well. So maybe you have seen a whole lot of, of self-organizing self teams. I have not seen any of them. I don't even see senior leadership teams as self-organizing. So there's always somebody with hierarchical responsibility for organizing the team. So take that as my experience. I'm not saying it has to be your experience. Now, let me talk about the role of the manager and one-on-ones. When managers have one-on-ones, they build trusting relationships with the people that they lead and serve. They understand what, what each person wants and needs. They can check in on career development. And one-on-ones are a signal a signaling mechanism. You listen for bad news. You hear signals of interestingness in the organization. Which is why I'm a, still a huge fan of every couple of weeks, depending on the kind of work that you do and your team does. If you have a work group, if you live and serve a work group, like customer support or customer success, or finance or HR. I think you still need regular one-on-ones every week. If you support, if you lead and serve a cross-functional product focused team, a feature team, then one-on-one um, -on -one every once every couple of weeks is probably fine. If you wait to only have a one-on-one -on -one every month, that's too long to build a trusting relationship. You don't you know, you're not giving people enough information about how, about creating an environment that works for them. And you don't have enough information on, um, on what's on the signals when things are going wrong. Um, I'm talking about the official reporting structure, but yeah, I am not talking about Scrum Masters having, um, having one-on-ones with the people that they lead and serve because the scrum master leads and serves a team. So you might need one-on-ones to understand where there are problems, but I'm not talking about one-on-ones as career growth, as, um, as anything else. James asks about skip levels to discern BS and the information reaching higher up. I am not fond of skip level one-on-ones for signals. However, here's how I do that. If I am a VP or C level and I, I work with the managers at the director level, or if I'm a director 
and I work with managers at the at the first level man, um, management level. I ask them, what kinds of difficult things have you seen? What kinds of signals are you seeing? And if they say, oh, everything's fine, boss, I know they're lying to me. They're, or, or they are not, um, they are not searching out the difficult problems and the impediments. Every organization has impediments. It does not matter what you're doing, right? Every organization does. And if they are not seeking out those impediments and, and often bringing them up to me because they, they will say, you know, at my level, this is not something I can fix. I need to involve you and your peers. That's, that's one of the things you get from regular one-on-ones when a manager has regular one-on-ones with the people that they lean and serve. And it happens at every single level. So um, I, really th- I really like thinking about agility as a way to bring transparency into the organization. And so hopefully, James, we do not need skip level one-on-ones to manage the BS in the organization. So, um, oh, uh, one thing about the regular one-on-one time, you make sure that you read maker schedule and manager schedule from Paul Graham. That's the best, um, the best reading I have ever seen on how people can manage when to have one-on-ones with people who need to do deep technical work. Now, what's really interesting here is, um, if you have, if you if your team works on flow efficiency as a mob, and they take a break every ninety minutes, that might be an excellent opportunity for you to have a one on one with somebody. So it's really important to think about what matters in your organization, right? This is all what we can discuss, um, how we treat each other, and what do we reward. Um, so I. I talked about Scrum Masters um, briefly, but I am not fond of Scrum Master um, making the decision to have one-on-ones as a manager for people. Now, if you need to, if you need to have a private conversation with somebody because of something that they said and you want to offer feedback, yes, that would be literally a one-on-one. However, I'm much more inclined for Scrum Masters to have community of practice or one-on-ones as peers with each other. Because that way you can see what other Scrum Masters are doing across the organization. So this is the structure from a manager led one-on-one to a person led one-on-one. This is the left one is the first structure. This is the second structure. Led asks what, what would be different in dynamics having a one-on-one with the manager versus a scrum master. So a scrum master is not gonna um, do career development. The scrum master is going to try and clear impediments for the team, but what, what if the impediment is the scrum master? You need to talk to your manager about that. Not, not all scrum masters are able to manage the, um, the dynamics of the team, especially if the dynamics of the team are going in a downward spiral. So, uh, well, I hope the Scrum Masters can do that. The person who can resolve those impediments are not the, not always the Scrum Master. And if, if the manager um, uses this minimal one-on-one structure, now, now you can really understand what all the signals are in the, in the team for the person in the organization. So I am, um, yeah, I'm not really a fan of Scrum Masters and one-on-ones instead of the manager. I want to see, I feel very strong that the, that the manager, because of the reward system, has all kinds of influence on the culture. So the more the manager is involved building a trusting relationship with the people doing the work, the more likely the manager is to, could, to create an effective culture, right? To refine that effective culture for the team and with the team. I hope that that, um, 
So, so David, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that where the, you said the manager can have a one-on-one -on -one with a scrum master to, to complete the feedback loop. I am not fond of triangulation. So I am hoping that you mean something else. Oh yeah, so I, I was in an environment or, or a workplace where um, the, the manager had one-on-ones with their people and then they would kind of relay feedback to me that um, wasn't coming up in the retrospective and we'd work together on, on how to address that in a way that didn't uh, make anyone feel uncomfortable. That's what I meant by that. Oh, so that's a team where um, they are not even close to self-directed. You, that, yeah, there, there was some uh, interpersonal relationship issues going on in the team um, and uh, they were being brought up to the manager and the, those people didn't feel comfortable bringing it up in the retrospective. And then we strategized on, on how we could work together to help the team resolve those issues. It, maybe yeah, it if there's not... It <laughs> seemed, to, seemed to work all right, but maybe not in every environment. Yeah, I think that when the team members don't have enough psychological safety, if you have an ungeller on the team, someone who prevents a team from gelling, that's really a problem. So I really like in self-directed teams, I really like this structure for a one-on-one, -on -one, really the minimal structure, right? You don't have to have a lot of structure there, but enough to understand what's going on. So one of the things I really like about one-on-ones, especially for the manager, is you can offer reinforcing feedback often. Now, you, that means you have to see people doing the work or having a meeting or something. But the more you offer reinforcing feedback, the more people will do all that stuff. And um, then the early warning signals of larger problems. I find that I often see, I often saw um, early warning signals in the one-on-one -on -one before we could even tell that it was affecting the team. I, as a manager, I want to see the team's system or environment, and I don't want to have to do performance reviews, not just because they don't work, but because I don't understand how to do performance reviews in an agile environment, right? And I, and I don't want any surprises. So I really like thinking about um, evaluations as managing money, not performance. And the more I can offer feedback and help people work as a team in, in flow efficiency, the more likely I am to have a successful team. So um, I, I spoke about reinforcing feedback before. Um, and I also, uh, I find that you might not have to do a lot of feedback offering. This is in my neighborhood, and um, this is a 25 mile an hour or under speed um, speed limit. So I felt very good that I was only doing 22. Um, this this might be the smallest kind of feedback you offer to people on a regular basis. And I really like thinking about feedback like this. So I, I already talked about reinforcing feedback and, um, and change focus feedback. One thing I missed about reinforcing feedback, the more you can talk about stuff that supports other people, the more the team might work in flow efficiency. So another, another reason to use flow efficiency thinking in actions. Now, let me talk a, a little bit about the environment where everybody can succeed. I, saw, I spoke a little bit about collaboration and cooperation and the difference between them. And I'm a very big fan of collaboration because I find that when I, when I work in collaboration, uh, uh, when I work in cooperation, I somehow have a whole bunch of fog and mist. But when I work in collaboration, especially in so efficiency, I'm much more likely to have sunshine I can really understand what's going on. That means I need to weed out the non-gellers, the people who cannot do the work. So the non-gellers are the people when 
when you were back in the office and you had an in-person meeting and everybody was talking and having a nice time joking around with each other and then a non-jeller walked in and everybody stopped talking. Right? Nobody talked. That, was, that person was a non-jeller, an unjeller. I find that unjellers are, um, there's, they're equal opportunity. Men, women, managers, um, mostly technical people, doesn't matter. So I really like to weed out the ungellers and often help them find a job in our competitor. Yeah, I know. Um, every time I say that, people laugh. But I find that's it's really good for all the, everyone involved, which means I need to hire for people who can work as part of a team. That means I need to hire for sufficient cultural fit. A lot of what people talk about as hiring for cultural fit is all about comfort for the other person, not about culture fit. So I really like to say, um, can this person, can we agree on what to discuss? Can we agree on how to treat each other? Can we agree on what the rewards should be even if we are not there yet? Then I can hire for diversity of thought and experience. Um, so. I find that reinforcing feedback is necessary for, for everybody for everybody to be able to succeed. And we need reinforcing feedback so that we can offer feedback uh, when, when experiments don't totally work, but when we learn from them instead, right? Experiments are not always supposed to work. In fact, possibly the best experiments are the kind where um, they, the experiment fails, but we learned a lot. We learned what not to do. If you, if you are not able to use reinforcing feedback in your team, you might never ever get to that point. There's a word for this where, uh, where everyone can succeed. And Drago calls this the harmonious whole. So, if you are, if you as a manager or you as a scrum master are having trouble with a particular person whose behavior is not really helpful, remember this quote, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. And as a leader in the team, as you are a scrum master, you are a leader in the team, you, you are willing to tolerate or not willing to tolerate certain kinds of behavior. So I really like to say, um, especially when other people want to know what's going on with your team, that I really like to back the team. I want to support the team in all cases, um, and which is why I really like the buck stops here. And I, I will take ultimate responsibility. Oh, I missed a couple of comments. Um, so sometimes non-jellers are non-jellers for reasons outside of their control. This is true. Um, but if it, if it impacts the team performance, um, they somehow have to address it. This is where if, if people are um, having personal issues, having issues at home, almost all companies of larger than, you know, 20 or 25 people have an employee assistance system or an employee assistance group or something in HR or an employee assistance program. Um, see what you can do to help your, your team member if they want it. So um, I will say that one, I felt very badly about one guy I had to fire many years ago. He all, he was clearly having mental issues, um, emotional issues. It looked like he was suffering a mental breakdown. I asked him to please get help that we could give him short-term disability or long-term disability if he was, um, if he felt unable to come to work, but he needed to come to work for us to pay him or we needed a signature from a psychiatrist or a physician. And he said, I cannot, I cannot talk to a doctor. And I said, you've been out of work for four weeks. We cannot pay you anymore. 
you need to go get professional help and then I can figure out how to pay you. But you mean, we need something so we can help you. He said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, I need to fire you then and I don't want to fire you. I want you to get the help that you need. No, he was not willing to do that. I felt horrible about that. But my job as a manager was to support the rest of the team. I could not backfill his position and I could not, I could not, I was stuck. I couldn't go backwards. I couldn't go forwards. He was stuck. It was a horrible situation. And uh, I don't know what ever happened to him. I hope that he's still alive and he figured out how to get help. But this is, this is the problem when it's an ungeller and they, it's, it's reasons beyond the scope of control of work. You need to figure out what you can do as the manager. And if you are a scrum master, then you need to work with the manager to figure out what to do. Which is also why managing yourself is so necessary. So um, I'm going to address any, any of those other questions later. So you might have noticed that I referred to some of these principles. So when I talked about value, I talked about clarifying your purpose and building empathy with the people who do the work. I talked a lot about safety. And uh, the third principle is build a safe environment. Um, I talked a lot about outcomes and optimizing for an overarching goal. I talked a lot about experiments and learning and catching people succeeding. That's the reinforcing feedback. Um, I think that my last example was about my value-based integrity. I felt very torn between what this person needed and what the organization could do and what I needed to do for the team. And I decided to work for the betterment of the team, not for this person as an individual and not for my management. And for me, that worked. Um, I, have, um, I have been in too many um, meetings with managers where I had to, where, where when I left that meeting, I walked back into my office and called my husband and said, I might not have a job in an hour. I, I am willing to stand on principle. And I, am, I have never been a single parent with small children. I have never been the person who has the health insurance for all of us. So I have a lot more flexibility than some of you might have. So I've talked a lot about theory, and I would like you to think about how you move from individual theory to team-based practice. And that means I need to, to think about experimentation. What will you choose to experiment with? How will you choose to apply it? How will you engage with the people? How can you recognize the results? And then choose where you will experiment and learn more. A lot of people talk about the agile mindset, about beliefs. I don't talk about beliefs. I talk about mindset. I talk about behaviors. Behaviors we can see and hear. We can feel them. So our behaviors are all about how other people feel. So I would like you to, when you choose something to practice, practice a new behavior and don't bother with belief or mindset. That will come after you see how the behavior works for you. And our culture absolutely drives our behaviors. So if you are working in a resource efficiency team where people take their parts and then hand off, then you and the culture rewards that, then people will, will work in resource efficiency. They will not work in flow efficiency. It's all about what the rewards are. We maximize our rewards and minimize our punishment. If, we, if our culture rewards cooperation, we will work in resource efficiency. If our culture rewards um, collaboration, we will work on in flow efficiency. So I hope that you decide to stay in touch with me. I've written a bunch of books, as Vlad said. Thank you, Vlad. Um, I write the Pragmatic Manager newsletter. I, I would love to link with all of you on LinkedIn, the Modern Management Made Easy books. 
this is the initial um the the kind of the landing page and i will stop the share and um open up for questions and uh joanna before we go to questions i'm assuming you're gonna have the slides as well so we attach them uh somewhere yeah, yeah i will i will post them on speaker deck and send you and david um the Thank link you. Yeah, and we will post it on the meetup as well. Yep. yep. Okay, uh, so there are um there were questions I missed. Do people just want to speak up and ask a question live? If maybe we'll try that. I kind of go oh, ahead. Go go ahead. Thank you. I have something that I'm curious about and, you know, I don't actually have a lot of experience in this area and um, maybe I'm kind of an idealist, but when we, we talk about rewarding teams and, and wanting people to work as a team, but still usually in most organizations, you, you know, you might be on a team today but not everyone on that team is going to be able to get the promotion. Not everyone is going to be able to become a senior principal engineer or some, or whatever the title is. And so mm -hmm. there's always going to be competition naturally and people won't want to always work as a team, even, even though they're great people and they want to, to really help. So I was always thinking, well, what about, what about promoting teams? Like, what about saying like we don't care if there is even a one person who doesn't perform that well on this team that person actually does perform well as a team member and they're part of the success of that that team um i'm not sure about promoting teams i have to think about that however i did write a series of posts about the career ladder and why why the career ladders we have as dual track are insufficient for what we want. So I would I would really like so um, while I heard what you said that there are few um, promotion availables, um, let me let me let me rephrase that in English maybe um, that there are fewer higher level positions. Not everybody wants a higher level position. So one of the most talented first line managers I ever worked with well, only wanted to be a first line manager. Why? Because he wanted to, to work with people who were new in their careers and help them succeed so they could choose either a higher level technical position or move up into management. And I find that this is when we have principal engineers and consulting engineers, right, whatever we call them. Um, if they are interested in supporting the, the work of other people, we might want to move them across the career ladder. So as I think about um, careers, not everybody wants a promotion or, or once they get to a place, they want more money maybe because they offer more value, but they don't need to offer, they don't necessarily need a promotion, right? So this guy as a first level manager should, should have been um, a middle senior manager for the money that he got. But the reason he got that much money was because he was supporting all these other people who were new in their careers and really growing them. So once we start working on the on the idea of that we need to think about compensation as how you support other people's growth, that totally changes the idea of, of our compensation. I'd, I'd like to add something to Sharon. Uh, what what I when I've heard Craig Larman talk about this is that he, he recommends the HR system promote developers to be higher level developers, like developer one to level two to level three. And it's not a manager position they're being promoted into. It's they're getting a better compensation for learning more applications, more um, different skills that make them better teammates. 
Um, so that was that was something, and I really like your idea. I mean, like if you promote a team for doing really well, um, and and they're all kind of learning new skills together, I think that's a really really neat idea. But it sounded like you wanted to add something more. Well, no, I mean, I, that actually, what you're talking about was sort of more along the lines of what I was thinking, but Joanna, what you were saying also makes sense too, because sometimes some people do want to, to eventually leave that type of role in the team and they want to do something completely different. And some of them really are happy to do exactly what they've been doing. And some of them might not even care if they get a pay raise or, or not, you know, I mean, but um, I, I think most people would probably appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of, I mean, if I was, if I had an organization that was making something and it, that I was dependent on having teams function really, really well, and I had a team that functioned really, really well, I would want to reward them a lot. And I'd want to either have them, you know, stay as a team and keep on making stuff, or I might want to split them up so that they could teach other teams to have that same type of dynamic and make better teams. So as soon as you split a team, it's not the same team, right? But so you, so there is a pattern of, um, if you want to, to create a pervasive culture throughout the organization, that you take a team that's working well and ask them if they want to split, and then you see the other teams with those people. Um, you need to be aware of the pickle effect. Jerry Weinberg talked about this in, um, in I think it's Secrets of Consulting or maybe Are Your Lights On? I don't remember which book. That if, you, if you're a cucumber in a vat of pickles, you turn into a pickle. You do not remain a cucumber. So that's, that's an issue of splitting a team. It's, I have found it more effective in my experience. And again, this is my experience only that, um, yeah, Vlad says it doesn't work the other way. Um, nobody can ever become a cucumber again. So what I find more valuable is to reinforce the behaviors we want to see and, and to learn what is preventing those behaviors in the other teams. And that, that actually, that was the other thing that I wanted to ask about, which is the idea of, do you have experience with, um, with trying to sort of measure or quantify team behavior? Like to say, like, for example, some professional basketball teams, they'll say to someone, well, you know, you're, you've really improved your skill at like making baskets or dribbling. I don't watch basketball, but um, what we need you to improve is you need to be passing that ball. Like you're not giving up the ball to other people when they can actually make the shot better than you can. That's not good team behavior. So is there a way of having some aspect of that? Like, for example, on a scrum team? So yes, the, the short answer is yes. In both manage it, your on uh, your guide to monitor pragmatic project management and, and create your successful agile project, which is totally agile approach agnostic, I have the idea of radar charts. And the team, especially in create your successful agile project, decides which behaviors they want to work on as a team. And then they, I, I recommend that they rank themselves as a team, not as individuals. Once the team has enough psychological safety, then it's fine for people to get, um, to get feedback. However, as soon as you have individual-based compensation, I don't see how you can do this, right? Team-based behavior arises from several options, but the first is right, um, a culture of flow efficiency, where you say we want to work together as a team. And secondly, Rewards that are at least partly team-based. If you do, if you only have individual-based rewards, you will never get the passing. Right, the passing game will not exist. Instead, you will have, uh, well, the basketball passing game or the football, yeah, hockey, whatever. Right, but you will only get individual work where then people have to wait 
for work to come to them. Now you might say as a team, um, well, let's do a value stream map. And we see it, we, we typically have delays where um, a Johanna finishes her development and Vlad is not yet able to, um, to do code review on it. And in a retrospective, we say, you know, that Johanna, right? Johanna, are you aware that every single time you take a story, you have to wait for Vlad because he, he also took a story? And I say, yeah, yeah, I, I'm aware of that. And then somebody might ask, what are the three options we can do? And Vlad might say, Johanna, what if we pair on that story? And then we pair on my story. And so we build in code review as we go. That's option one, right? Well, I might, well, I might say option one is Vlad should be faster. Thank you, Vlad, for letting me use you. Um, and, and then option two is Johanna should be slower. There, I mean, I'm being facetious with these three options, but if we, if we assume that everything in our, in, our, in our culture is up for grabs, if we want more collaboration, then we can say, how do we get more collaboration? And let's look at the value stream map. Let's look at what we, what we reward. Let's look at, um, at the influence we have over all these various pieces of the product and the, and the process. I put in um, up there, I'm, I'm moving back up in, in the chat. I put in this, um, this blog post from March about why the, the, the popular and easy career ladder prevents an agile culture, part one, that's a series. I did a workshop later, uh, which changes the career ladder and makes it, I think, better. Um, and so, so I have a bunch of ideas about this, but I think it's really hard if our, if our HR policies are built around resource efficiency, it's really, really hard to change that. So, uh, Joanna, I had a kind of a corollary to this. Um, so it seems that any, we could say any agile adoption, but you could really say any change to a more effective way of working that is aligned with the type of values that we're discussing here um, is one senior manager change away from failure. And, but I, but okay, that's nice and snarky, but let me go farther and say, but it seems to me that from my experience, it seems that the enlightened manager, the enlightened senior management uh, is the anomaly rather than the, the, uh, the normal outcome of the structure, right? And the more I think about this, and, and I don't have answers and I don't, I don't really know, um, it seems to me that some of this boils down to ownership structure. And if you're at a startup, and everybody has equity, then people do what is best for the product, not what is best for themselves per se. I mean, they take care of their family. They, that's, you know, family always comes first, but, uh, but, and not only what's good for the team, they talk about what's good for the company. How do we make this successful? Because they're all incentivized to do it. Um, you can't take a, uh, it would be at least very challenging if not impossible for a publicly traded company to change the ownership structure because it would be, you know, you have uh, some teacher whose teaching fund has invested in, you know, IBM or, or some oil company or whatever. And it would not be fair to say, well, we're gonna take that ownership stake away from you. And it would not only, it wouldn't even be legal, right? So when the company was formed, the, the, uh, the die was cast as to how the ownership structure would go. Now you could build cooperatives. You could have uh, what are these ESOP type programs, and I guess you could do that, um, but those can backfire. So, uh, so I have not. So there's questions there around structure, and I don't have answers. I just have questions. Um, but there does seem to be this. It seems that 
self-serving sea level is the norm. Um, and it seems to go that way. And it seems to be this value extraction type of thing. And of course, they get to behavior that you would expect. Um, and then, you know, you'll hear people talk about, you know, there's the easy stuff, like you get rid of bonuses, or you have them be flat across the org. Um, there's these badges idea, you know, every time you learn a skill, but that for some reason, that doesn't have the ring of truth to it. It doesn't seem that it's an implementable thing. Um, can I, can I, you have yes, a whole bunch of stuff yes, here. Yes. And, um, yeah. So I believe that, um, I thought it, the name of the company was Morningstar, the people who make yes. tomato sauce. Yeah. I believe that they are a publicly traded company. But what's really different about them. I think they're them, private. Aren't they private? I think are that's, they, or they work. Um, I think the magic yeah. is they're private. I, I'm not sure that the magic is the private. I think that the magic is um, the CEO and the senior leadership team's yeah. salary is not pegged to the stock price. It's pegged to outcomes. So when you peg, when you say to people, um, you're, um, so a lot of these, a lot of these senior executives get, you know, call it a million bucks in salary. They get 12, 25, 50 million in stock price, in stock. And, uh, and they vest much, much faster than those of us who were middle managers before, right? So they don't have five-year vesting. And if they, if they get fired, they vest all at once. So you've heard about the golden parachute. <laughs> if you, if you think about it, you are a person on your way up, right? You're not old like I am. You're 45. You're, um, you're, you're right where you want to be for your career. And you want to be able to do some angel investing. What would you do? given that you you get, call it even half a million in, in straight salary compensation, which I think is pretty darn generous. And then you get 25 million in stock that vests over two or three years. And if they fire you, you get it all at once because that's how you wrote your, your contract. And what, they signed what it. Would you, and they signed it. What would you do for the stock price. Would you continually try and goose the stock price? Absolutely. Would you work for the betterment of the organization? We do what is rewarded and we so, don't do what's punished. So my theory about agile transformations is I have been in, um, I was a lead, I was a sub, I was a, any number of, of a consultant for several very large company agile transformations. I got brought in on the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. I don't believe even, I thought I was, I thought I was getting somewhere when we had an entire department, a unit, a division, but because the, uh, the umbrella organization decided on the management structure and the management rewards, no, we were one senior manager away from failure and we did. So I, um, none of the stuff I've talked about tonight is new. Peter Drucker started writing about it. Um, Mary Follett started writing about it in the, in, what, in the teens or the 20s or the 30s. I don't remember when, when Mary was alive. Drucker wrote about it in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s, 70s. I mean, this is not new. But we somehow, we don't teach it in MBA school. So aside from, um, I believe it's Henry Mintzberg, who is kind of the, the wacky um, managers, not MBAs, and uh, other interesting reading, um, we, don't, we don't train managers like this. So the reason why small companies can create any kind of a transformation to more effective ways of working is because they can attack the reward structure. But until you attack the reward structure, you cannot. So I no longer take agile transformation work with large companies. I don't do it. 
I, I offer my workshops to them, right? But I'm not, I don't, I don't even try because I find it way too frustrating. Any thoughts on why the board creates the kind of current, the kind of incentive systems they do? I don't think that they, um, I don't think they realize the consequences because they're not looking at the system. Because they're missing so that background. They're, pardon? Because they're missing said background. The manager's not MBAs. Yeah, I, I think that, I think a lot of it is, a few of us have been trained to look at systems. And even if we do look at systems, we often go to the first, um, the first apparent cause as opposed to the real root cause. So I, this is tricky, right? This is, um, we're dealing with people. People are infinitely varied and, and infinitely, um, wonderful and messy. And just because I've seen this pattern, you know, 25 times does not mean it, even I have all the right answers. So I think it's, I think it's really important, um, not necessarily to lose hope, Joel, but I think to think about what you can do, right? What can I do in my little corner of, of my organization? Am I a manager? What, what could I, could I start the conversation with HR? Could I make it possible for us in this department to succeed? And I think that that would be <clears throat> really helpful. Yeah, I think there's degrees of success that can be reached yes. and giving up is is not. Uh, yeah, I hope no one walks away from this thinking, well, well, I can't change the board of directors or I can't work at a big company and do you know some good work for some good people. There's still a lot of good opportunities out there. It may not be lasting, but it matters for those people for that period of time. And yeah. Uh, yeah. that can be worth it. I would even well, think about, okay. sorry, go ahead, yeah. Can I say one thing, Ogden, and then I sure. promise to let you talk. Think about what it would mean if you were, instead of, remember Sharon was talking about supporting other people as they learned. What it would, what would it be like if you could support other people as they learned more agile mindset thinking and agile behaviors? How much better could we make the world, even if you're in this little, little place? I apologize, Ogden. No, no worries. I'm just thinking about how, as always, it's interrelated to our personal lives, right? Um, and uh, let's just say some people, as an example, would go to uh, see a homeless person and say, oh, I'm not going to help him. He needs a job, right? They just assume right away. Or they're just like, ah, oh, what's giving 20 bucks going to do? That's not going to change anything. All right. Um, even even if that person did get better, right? Instead, it's like, oh, if I'm going to do something, it needs to be for the for the, a larger cause or for, hey, we're going to vote for a, a certain president, right? Anything you can think of a million examples, right? It's like, oh, but why, you know, I know the right thing to do, but I'm going to do it for myself and my value system and my beliefs versus how successful I think it'll be. Because then everybody's going to think that same thing. And then nothing will ever get done, right? And, and that we see that over and over with everything in, in life. And in fact, I would even say, to, to a point, human civilization has, <laughs> right, has have actually gone extinct due to that very reason, right, where history repeats itself, and we can go into philosophy there, but at the end of the day, that's what it is, right? Um, if we don't, uh, we all, even, even in our personal lives, we care about our family. We just heard family f comes first from James, right? We know what to do, let's say, for our country, right? Um, or we know what's good for the majority of people, but nobody wants to take that first step, because even if they do, their own family is being hurt. They are being hurt. So why so am I, I going to do it? Even though I personally believe in it, I'm hurting everyone else because of my personal belief, everyone else I care for. So uh, uh, there's no good answer to that, right? <laughs> but that's what it boils down to in, in a lot so of this context, is, right? Mm -hmm. This is why I really like the idea of one-on-ones with the manager, where you can say, I really want to push on this thing so we can really make our agile approach work. And I need you to give me cover. And if the manager is willing to give you cover, and maybe the manager says, um, um, as one of my managers said, 
said, Joanna, you want all this? I can give you cover for that. Okay, I'll take it. But I was able to do some really good work inside of boundaries I did not particularly like, but I did the work anyway. That was part of my personal integrity. And if we use, and I, I so if you have not yet read um, Esther Derby's uh, Seven Rules for Change, what Esther's, Esther's book about change, read that, right? Because it's all about change by attraction, slow change. I think that a, a lot of us are impatient for what we think we could actually get. We don't need to be impatient. We can do one little thing and make it happen here. And then if we are too frustrated, we take our football and go to the next place and we try the next thing. And maybe that's a different department in the same very large organization. And maybe it's a different company. Maybe you work for yourself. Maybe you work for somebody else. I, I, I am a total optimist. I'm not unrealistic in my optimism. Look, we, we, these, these 12 guys, 12, 14, whatever it was, wrote the manifesto in 2001. And look where we are now. Those of you who are younger don't even remember Waterfall anymore. However, I certainly do. And nobody would admit to having Waterfall now, although senior managers are still looking for the Waterfall um, data. But I think, I think this is also, we need to educate them, not by saying, Instead of, it's not by saying the schedule of variance is wrong, but by saying, how fast can we get you an outcome that you want? Right, we change the conversation and that allows us to start changing the conversation about everything. So James, it's entirely possible that our reward system will not change in my lifetime. God, I, ho I hope I live a long time and I hope it does change. However, I am sowing the seeds here for other people to continue this fight. That's why I wrote the books, right? Because all of you are now saying, huh, Johanna is wacko. Maybe I'll read these books and see if I can figure out what to do at where I work. That's perfectly fine with me. So yeah. I, I really yeah. want people to, to think about what they could do. And what, even if it's a really small change, what could happen? It's about internalizing, leading by example. Right? A lot of a lot of people say we we like to do that or we do do that, but do we really? <laughs> do we really? Right in the truest sense of the term. Question we should all ask ourselves. I want to be clear. I didn't really lose hope. I just I did literally. <laughs> I literally did come from a meeting with HR to this meeting an hour late, and so. Better late than never. Feeling a little cynical, but, <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate the, the optimism, Johanna. Thank you. They do say uh, pessimist is an optimist with experience. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, I've seen some progress uh, recently uh, where I'm working at now, US Bank. They It was about a year ago they implemented the uh, tiered developer system where you're like, a software developer one two three four five six and you they haven't i don't think the managers have been educated on hey you should be um incentivizing people to learn learn if they're developer learn how to test and participate that on the team or learn this other application so you can work on multiple applications i don't think they've implemented it properly but someone got the ear of hr and told them hey you can actually promote people within a developer uh, uh, track and not only to a manager track uh, because, you know, as we know, all know, a lot of developers sometimes only get can get promoted to a manager role and they really don't want to manage. They want to keep being a product developer. So uh, for better or worse, I mean, they, they, I'm, I'm starting to see some movement, uh, at least anecdotally. So, I mean, I, I think the future has a lot of good things coming uh, and HR is becoming more aware of what Agile is how they can enable agile. Um, I think more talks about that and more education in that area is going to be really helpful for everyone uh, in the product development field. It just takes time. 
It question, does. Joanna? Takes time. Quick question. So have you been in an organization or have you influenced the um, the title or, or organizational design structure in, in, in any way or getting them to think about a model or, or some idea that you've seen online or in another book about, hey, here's a sample org structure that can be modeled after or can be customized or a framework that can be customized? Oh, yeah. I've written about... Um... Um, the the link I have in in the chat about the career ladders, that's something I did. Um, I started to do something like that many years ago when I worked with several clients just in the past couple of years on a three tier a three a three track structure. Um, they did not use as much influence as I think that they needed. Um, they were still and they still focused on years years of experience and a BS in computer science, which uh, I happen to have a BS in computer science and a master's in systems engineering. And those degrees are so old, they are not useful anymore. So looking at a degree five or 10 years out is just silly in my experience, just not that useful. So I, um, if you look back at the, at the chat and um, David, I'm hoping that you will you will give me a copy of the chat later. I also have a speaker deck there of um, a workshop I led at a different um, um, at a conference about how to use the the triple track career track. And then I'm um, I'm planning on doing a compensation series of blog posts based on a on a triple track. So um, I have found that a lot of people are very interested in this and HR is supposedly the way in HR is tentative about how to do this. They don't understand. So I think that we can help them by, by explaining. We have more technical people who have influence throughout the code base and the test base. We have more, um, um, well, technical product people, technical um, process and product people. And then we have a manager kind of people. And while you might have um, people that there's, I, I often think of associate engineer and then starting with senior engineer that you cannot really facilitate the product or the process until you have at least as much experience as roughly a senior engineer. That's my prejudice. You don't have to agree with me. And that you need to be at least a level above that to have responsibility to lead and serve other people. So um, that's my experience and I have, um, and you don't have to like it, <laughs> right? And in which case I, I offer you the option to write your own career ladder posts and maybe Tell me when you've written them so I can learn from you. But that's, I, I've done that and it's been very helpful. Um, Thank you. Joanna, well, do you have any concrete examples of, uh, you know, role definitions, career progression, and to give some, to clarify this a bit, I have often explained things like definition of done to teams. And, you know, there's yeah. tons of things that, that talk about that. In contrast, after doing that, if I put three or four examples of concrete examples of what teams actually had as their definition of done, and then I say, okay, pick and choose from what you see here, create, you know, evolve at your own, that, that specification by example, this here is, here is an example of the real thing, gets rid of all the hand-waving. Um, I have never seen that. Maybe it exists. I don't know where to look. I have never seen that on the HR side of concrete examples to go look at of here is a structure that is aligned with an agile value system and is not hand wavy and ideally more than one example. So I am under non-disclosure with the clients See? that I've worked with. <laughs> That's the I mean, they actually, what they said to me was, um, we think that this is our secret sauce of how we use 
of how we get to business agility. So I cannot, um, I put, if you go back to that, um, that why the popular easy career ladder prevents an agile culture, um, that's a series of, of posts. And I think that um, the second post is the behaviors we want. So I, have, I didn't see the post. Yeah, I saw the I link. Did, I saw the link for a slide deck. I didn't see the link for the post. Move back up. Oh, okay. Okay. Back it's up more. Okay. Up yeah. So that's um. I find that that that's a series of four posts, and the behaviors oh. are um are where we really need to go to next. Which behaviors make sense? And then if you um. Here's um, this in here. Okay. Here's another post I wrote a long time ago. Um, this is how, this is where the behaviors would be in the first, um, the first row across that, um, that career line. And then you would have specifics under what the behaviors are for every given level. So I guess I will, I guess I can, um, one of the things I was planning on doing was actually doing a much more detailed version of this last link that I have there. We, we recorded that, Joanna, so we'll be waiting for the results now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vlad. Thank you. And since David is going to give me the chat, I can look up all these links later, which is good. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if I should check on time uh, with you, John. We're already one hour and uh, 45 minutes in, I believe. And I, I wanted to uh, ask you if you have any more time to answer any questions uh, or we should wrap up. What do you think? Well, I have, if there's one more question, that's good. Um, otherwise, yeah, I, it's, it's, um, it's later for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Okay, I'm gonna ask a question if no one is then. So I wanted to build on that example from the beginning, in the beginning. So imagine there's a junior and a senior developer on a team and the junior developer is constantly bugging the senior developer and this senior developer has asked the junior developer, you know, I need you to, I'm not able to get my work done. I need you to, you know, um, find time, set aside time where, where you can work together, but you can't just ping me all the time. And despite asking that junior developer, the junior developer continues to kind of pester the senior developer and the senior developer goes to their manager and kind of explains the situation. Well, the seat, the manager isn't in every meeting. Um, what would that? What would you say that manager should do? Should they work with the scrum? Should they meet with the scrum master one on one and say, "Hey, here's what I'm seeing," and start to strategize how to work together? Because I heard you say that was like an anti pattern, and 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 I wanted to get um, your your honest feedback on that. So I would actually ask, why are people working alone? They're sitting the in a bullpen. They're sitting in a bullpen next to each other. Oh, what do you? What was that again? And what's the whip? What's the what's the team's whip? The work in progress. So, yeah, does the team have any limits on their whip? Um, and if so, why is the junior developer working alone? Um, so, well, they they have a the, you know they 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 limit they limit their whip by pulling in a certain amount of work to each sprint, but they don't have like a whip for what's in progress at any given point during the sprint. Right. Right, so that's why they're working in resource efficiency mm -hmm. and the junior developer is really trying hard to do their best work and they don't know enough. Mm -hmm. The junior developer needs to work with other people. Mm -hmm. So why would you penalize the junior developer for wanting to maximize his or her compensation to show that he is valuable? Because mm -hmm. you're, if, you're, if you're not limiting the team's wit, this is why I wrote Create Your Successful Agile Project. If you're not limiting the team's whip, you're saying everybody must be fully utilized. That is anti-agile, mm -hmm. it's anti-agility. 
they're not right. working as a cross-functional team. So I would say, um, I would actually bring this up in a retrospective or Kaizen and say, I keep having this problem with a, as a senior developer, I keep having this problem. You guys want me to work at my fastest speed and you don't want me to, to help and support other people. Okay. That's why we get this, right? So this is so this is an early warning signal if the senior developer says to the manager in a one-on-one, -on -one, I don't get it. We're supposed to be agile. Or or maybe the senior developer is just so frustrated he or she doesn't get it anyway, right? Um, but if you if you ever hear, I'm supposed to do all this work because these are my stories in the sprint. Mm -hmm. I totally That's agree. an anti-pattern based on resource efficiency. Yep, yep. So, so what you're saying is that that the the manager instead of going to the scrum master to work together, they should just reply back to the senior developer. You need to bring that up in the retro. And then you you'd made a comment about triangulation is not a good thing. Where can you tell me more about why that's not a good thing? Right. So if if the if the senior developer is talking to and I'm assuming that this is a one-on-one -on -one in per, in real time, yep. right? Not yep. not by email. If the yep. if the senior developer is talking to the um, to the manager, and the manager might say, "Have you brought this up in a retrospective? Have you talked to the scrum master who is really supposed to facilitate the team? What what has happened any mm -hmm. of those times? Because the manager does not does not know." Is the scrum master capable of facilitating this team? Mm -hmm. Not all. You know, a lot of scrum masters don't have any lean information at all. They, don't, they only know about three columns. They don't know about cycle time. They don't know what they don't know. So they don't understand the lean, the lean thinking behind scrum. Mm. And okay. that's right. So, so you have someone who's... Um, Fine for a team that's already collaborating, but not fine for a team based on flow efficiency, where the the management the management structure, the management culture has said everybody must work at their maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might have right? been the, the case. The scrum master herself cannot fix that problem. The scrum master needs to go to the manager for help. And if the manager is not willing to help, I'm yeah. I, mean, I would not bother doing Scrum. I just would not. <laughs> I would. I, I'm serious. I would move to a Kanban board. I would manage the web. I would have a cadence of 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 um, of demos and a cadence of planning, which is very very different than a sprint goal. It's very different than a product goal. It's very different from all of Scrum. So I, I and I would use Kanban, not the Kanban method, just straight Kanban, as in ProKanban.org. And I would say, let's get our let's get our team process ready for when we could do Scrum. But I would I, I mean I just I really hate to bash my head against the wall. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, that would have been uh, an exciting time. And uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation and answering all the questions. I'm really grateful. They're very thought provoking. Uh, now I, I personally feel like I have to think about so many things, especially it's interesting how so much is still expected of managers and they have so many functions in uh, not, not every uh, framework or uh, uh, you know, value system describes and even tackle uh, deep enough into how many functions managers actually carry. And that is very interesting. We should actually continue thinking about this uh, developing in that area to understand how to become more agile and what uh, what really matters uh, in that case. I really appreciate the, the comments about the environment and uh, uh, how the culture impacts and the rewarding system reward system impacts the behaviors that uh, that is very uh, also leads to a lot of other questions and how to approach certain things. Uh, we will be 
uh, we'll continue thinking about how to that applies to less as the less uh, pretty much gravitating towards the system without management or reduced management structure uh, significantly. So that is a very interesting how that can uh, they play out and utilize the principle and agile principles as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time again and everybody and thank you very much for David organizing this wonderful community and Sam as well, Sam left uh, and everybody who joined uh, the conversation, a lot of uh, great uh, comments and questions. Yep. And thank thanks, you everybody. all. I really enjoyed this. Thanks, yeah. Joanna. Thank, thank you, you, Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Pickle. Bye. Great. <laughs> Cucumber. Bye. Bye. Bye.